Welcome to the National Arts Club NAC at Home program. I am your host, Angela Louie. I am the co-chair of the Fashion Committee and on the Board of Governors here at the National Arts Club. Thank you for spending some time with us today. If you're not familiar with the National Arts Club, it is a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. I also want to mention that today is Giving Tuesday. Please help us continue to offer these programs by making a donation through the link in the chat box. We have an extraordinary guest. Today, we get the inside story of the original pop fashionistas. The legendary Miss Mary Wilson is the founding member of the sensational vocal group, The Supremes, the most successful female recording group of all time. By 1968, The Supremes had 12 number one singles. The book Supreme Glamour by Miss Mary Wilson features the style of The Supremes and the music history that surrounds it. In the book, you'll see beautiful images of Miss Wilson, Diana Ross and Florence Ballard wearing the iconic looks that we all know today. We will see some of these images later on in this program. This book is about timeless glamour. It's about their transcending fashion, but it's also about how these women defined the world, the way the world saw black women and how black women saw themselves. You can purchase the book Supreme Glamour by Miss Mary Wilson through the link in the chat box. Today only, all books purchased will be signed by Mary. You can also ask questions for Miss Wilson in this chat box, and we will have a little time at the end of the program for Q&A. Miss Wilson, it is an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be here with you. Well, you're in New York and I'm in Las Vegas. <laughs> you look so fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, you look, I love your, your, your background there. It's beautiful. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about this beautiful book, Supreme Glamour, which is hardly your first book. Um, you started with Dream Girl, My Life as a Supreme. Then you wrote Supreme Faith, Someday We'll Be Together. Then it was reprinted together into one revised volume, Dream Girl and Supreme Faith, My Life as a Supreme. Ms. Wilson, could you tell us what inspired you to write this book, your fourth one? <laughs> well, well, can I just say one thing? I'm one of the founding members of the Supremes. Uh, Florence Ballard is the founding member. And uh, of course, Diane and I were right along with her, but she was, but Florence was the one. But also, you know, I have to give credit. You know, we all stand on someone's shoulder. I have to give credit for my becoming an author of my four books. Uh, from my 12th grade teacher, uh, Mr. Boone, his name is B-O-O-N-E. And he was my English teacher who told me when I was, I guess I was 16 and a half, getting ready to graduate, hopefully trying to graduate, until Mr. Boone told me, he says, Miss Wilson, he says, you know, I, I know you sing with that little group called the Primettes, because we were called the Primettes back then. Uh, he says, and he says, but if you want to continue to sing with them and to travel and all those things, you better pass my English class. And so, <laughs> you know, he was one of those teachers, let me tell you that every student hates to have him as your, 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 your teacher, right? Because <laughs> he was failure if he had to. But anyway, um, for my final paper there, uh, I wrote uh, about my life up to that point. And uh, it was, I mean, I was only, what, I'd say 16 and a half years old. So I mean, what life did I have, right? But it was quite extraordinary because I was not raised by my mom. I didn't know my mom nor my two brothers and sisters until uh, I was about 10 years old. So mm -hmm. I wrote about that. And I wrote about how, you know, parents lied to children and, and, and how could they do that to me and da 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 you know. But anyway, that 
was what I turned the paper in, and Mr. Dean gave me an A plus plus plus. And he oh. said, he said, Miss Wilson, he says, you know, I think you should consider becoming a writer instead of a singer and running out to that little Motown record. Uh, so I guess I, I guess I wasn't listening. I must have listened to him, Angela, because uh, I started keeping the diary. Because at, in those days we were running down to Motown, and it was this new up and coming company with all these great people. It was Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Mary Wells, The Miracles, The Temptations. All these people were coming in at that time, and it was exciting to me to meet all these talented people. So I started keeping this diary, and that's what inspired me to write my books. So it sounds like you were so lucky to have that teacher unlock that talent in you. And, and we certainly can see that amazing ability to write and tell, tell your story, um, especially in the intro, where, where you go into the story of how you have all of these boxes of gowns and costumes, but when you go to open them, many of the gowns are missing. How did that happen? Yes. Well, you know, because when we became famous, when we, the Supremes, became famous, we were traveling all over the world, and, and we had, uh, you know, chaperones and, 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 and bodyguards and all kind of people who took care of us at that point when, with the traveling. And so what happened was after we, when we could get, uh, say, a couple of gowns, we wore them on TV, we would have to store them. So some of the people who worked with us would store them, you know, just store them. So they, they had been stored all over America. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, so when I, and, and I, but when all the other girls, the Diane and Florence were no longer in the group, all the gowns came to me. Well, I guess maybe all of them didn't get to me. Some were still stored in different places and I didn't know about it. So I only had what, what was in my possession. Uh, and so, yeah, when I finally opened up the ones that were in my possession, I realized that everything was not there. Uh, I was very, I was very fortunate though, because uh, I have, Lots of fans have actually uh, given, found some of the uh, gowns online and they actually called me up or emailed me and said, Mir, would these gowns, you want us to get them for you because we know they're yours? And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. So they gave me money and some of them bought the gowns online from eBay. And then the most recent thing that happened was when I was in England, uh, one young lady found one part of a, a gown that we wore in the Timothy Williams TV special, she found a part of that gown in France, Paris, France. Well, it was outside of Paris, so it was in France. And uh, she said she only bought it because it was at a, a garage sale. Well, over there, I guess they called them a boot sale, uh, sale. And she bought it because she just loved the sparkly thing that was out there, you know, for sale. And she didn't realize who it belonged to until after she had bought it. And she looked at the tag and inside it had international, um, whatever the place that we stored it in and it had my name in it. And so they contacted me and she was so kind. She gave the gown back to me when wow. I went to the UK last year. Uh, and so she, yeah, she, she and I met and on the TV show, I think it was a BBC show. And she came and she uh, gave me the gown. Wasn't that something? That's I amazing. I some of the other people who have had our gowns were given back to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that's amazing that these are coming from all over the world, from from France and from mm -hmm. from uh, eBay, and it's just everywhere. So I'm I'm actually I'm very curious. Where do where were these gowns and costumes exhibited over you know over over the many years? Right. Well, I I got to give credit first of all to uh, the, the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum in Cleveland, Ohio, because they were you know, opening up their museum. And uh, I guess somehow or another, um, I, I was in touch with someone who was there at the museum and they said, oh yeah, we've been trying to find you know, Supremes uh, things so we can show them here at the museum. And I said, well, I have most of them and no one contacted me. So we got together and uh, they sent one of their representatives out to uh, my place in, here in Vegas. And uh, we went through all of the, that's when I went through all the boxes. <laughs> we went through all these boxes. I mean, some of them had been, they had been, 
the boxes have been around some of the homes I've had. I've had about eight or nine different homes all over America. And those boxes traveled with me everywhere I went. So anyway, when they came and we went through the boxes, pulled out the ones they, they felt that they would want to use, and um, they curated my uh, Mary Wilson Supreme gown collection for me. And it was exhibited, first of all, at the Rockwell Hall of Fame. So I, I owe them uh, so much gratitude for curating it for me. Because since then, in the question you asked about where they have been exhi exhibited, um, they, were, uh, they went to the Victoria uh, and Albert Museum in London, England. They were there for, I think, six or seven months. Then they toured uh, the UK uh, for about two years. Uh, they came back to America here. They've been at the Detroit Historical Museum there. They've been in, the, oh, right now. <laughs> They're on leave because of the pandemic, I gotta tell you, but some are at the Grammy Museum there at Newark, uh, New Jersey. And, but they're sort of resting because nothing can, you know, so they're resting up, but they are usually on tour. <laughs> uh, they were here in, in Los Angeles at the uh, Grammy Museum. They've been just, uh, oh, I'm empty. Um, they've been all over America, actually. <laughs> so many places. You know, um, one thing I want to say about the book is that first, it's a beautiful coffee table book, it has so many beautiful images. Um, spanning decades, um, mm -hmm. but also it's really, it's a, um, it's a book that shows um, many sides of, of you and the group. Mm -hmm. um, and you open up about your life, about your career, about your performing. And there is this amazing forward in the book by Whoopi Goldberg. And mm -hmm. here is some of what she writes. Mm -hmm. Everything about the Supremes, all those gowns, all those pantsuits, all those caps, gloves, furs, the makeup, the eyelashes, the wigs, make me believe that they were speaking to me. Mm. I too could be well-spoken, tall, majestic, an emissary of Black folks who also came from the projects. <laughs> Wasn't that beautiful? Yes. Oh. That yeah. is amazing. It, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to say that her, her entire forward is amazing. I only picked a small piece of it. And I wanted to ask this of you, which is, did you know, did you have any idea that you had such an impact on people during, that during this time? Well, first, first, no, we didn't know. I mean, I didn't know. But I do want to address the Whoopi over herself. When I thought of asking her, because I admire her so much. I think that she, she herself is brilliant, brilliant. And, you know, when I thought of asking her, I was a bit of afraid because I didn't know if she was going to, you know, say yes or no. But when she says yes, she would write something. I, it blew me away what she said. And, and even if people don't buy my book, I hope that they can read what she wrote because she wrote about a time here in America and American history when black people could not vote and my mother couldn't read and write, she was not required to go to school to get an education. This was back, she wrote about, you know, the early, the 50s and the, the early 60s when black people just were not treated very well. We were, we were, you know, depicted as just lazy, unworthy people, not even as human beings. And it was very demeaning. Uh, and a lot of the young people today have no idea about this because they, you know, they think that was a long time ago. Well, it was a long time ago, but I was alive, you know. <laughs> so when 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 uh, Whoopi wrote what she wrote uh, in the forward for my book, she wrote about those times mm -hmm. when black people weren't really seen on TV, and if they were, they were seen in very demeaning type roles. We didn't have any heroes. We didn't have I shouldn't say any, that's not true. We didn't have many heroes. Uh, you know, we had people like Nina Horn, Ethel Waters, Dorothy Dandridge, uh, Nat King Cole. There were people, but they were still in areas where- Mary, can I interrupt just one, one second? I am, uh, I'm getting some messages yeah. uh, of a request to see, to ask if you can lean closer to your mic so they can yeah. hear. 
Oh, you're not getting everything. I'll just bring it up so to you. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Perfect. When I, uh, when I move things around, sometimes I forget to move them up closer. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So I, I, I hope that's better. That should be better because I see my, my monitor moving up. So that should be better. Is that okay? Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Wilson. Yes. Oh, thank you for, for telling me that, sharing that. So yes, so Ms. Wu, Ms. Wu uh, Goldberg wrote the forward. I mean, she talked about the time when as a young girl, when she saw us on television, she, you know, it was black and white TV. It wasn't in color like we have today. So, you know, she wrote about how, yes, seeing three black women on TV really inspired her because there were very few blacks who were seen on TV. And unless like Miss Lena Horn always said, you know, sometimes in her movies, they wouldn't even show, she would be in a movie, but they wouldn't show her in the South because they didn't want, uh, well, you know, white people didn't want to see a black woman on TV looking glamorous like Miss Horn did. So I, that's what I was so thrilled when uh, Wolfie wrote that in uh, my forward because she expressed that. And that we, if we inspired her by being three beautiful black women in those, when she was a young girl, I was, you know, that was very honored and very pleased with what she said, because it was true. You know, we, we Supremes did dare to dream at a time when it was not a very good time for black people to try to dream. We were just trying to get a job, you know, trying to, to, to move forward. My mother said the one thing she wanted to see was her children go to college. For her who could not read and write, that was a major, major thing, so. I'm very happy with that. But thank you. I'll say it to everyone, thank you, Whoopi, for my forward. She was just beautiful. She's my hero. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing. And you know, you mentioned a little bit about you know being an inspiration for um, for people and for for other um, artists at that time during a time when it was very challenging um, but yes. also you remain an inspiration today your style has paved the way for um the looks of female black pop artists today from destiny child to um janelle monet to janet jackson and all others hasn't it well yeah you know i'm so happy that florence diane and i had a, a way of, of dressing back from the, you know, 1959, when we first started singing, I re remember we had cheap pearls on that we bought from uh, Woolworths. A lot of the young people may not even know about Woolworths because I don't know, are they still around? But, you know, <laughs> but we bought, bought our little pearls from there, $5. <laughs> Who knew? So, you know, and then when we went to Motown Records, I'm very, so happy that they saw who we were as uh, as young women and decided to, to, to allow us to keep our image. I mean, so we came there with, with this sort of, uh, even though we were young and we were wearing cheap jewelry, <laughs> it still was very, very uh, sophisticated. And uh, they were smart enough to see, oh, that we don't have to do anything with them. They, that's, that's their image. And that image is what my, and you mentioned my book, Supreme Glamour. That's what my book is all about, the glamour that we, the three of us, Diane, Flo and myself, you know, we wanted, that's what, that's who we were. And uh, I'm very happy that the book has been, I mean, people have been just sending me emails and letters, you know, saying how much they love the book and that they, they're going to buy it for Christmas gifts. I'm like, bye, 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 bye. <laughs> because, you know, you just hard, you, with everything closed, you know, the uh, bookstores and, and all kinds of places are, are just closed. So I'm glad that they're still able to find um, sources to actually buy the book. So that's great. So thank you, Whoopi. <laughs> so, you know, um, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you became a trendsetter and broke barriers at a very special time. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what role do you think the television played in bringing your music and your style to the whole world? Yes, you know, television played a huge role. And I, and I say this because Today, you know, the new technology obviously is the internet and we're also 
uh, you know, got the, all the all the technology, the Zooms that we're on now, you know, if you have the Skype and I mean, technology has just been just moved so, so far. Who knew back in the 50s and the 60s that this would be happening today. But back then you see television was the new technology. And be prior to that, there were many great groups out there, especially female groups. You know, we weren't the first. I mean, I remember I was inspired by the um, uh, Shirelles, the Chantels, the Toys, uh, you know, all those wonderful girl groups from uh, the 50s and the early 60s. But you see, television had not really uh, come about in a big way until, uh, you know, the early 60s. So that's what kind of really helped the Supremes become a major force because we were on television. The Ed Sullivan Show was one of those newer uh, TV shows, variety shows that we don't have today, which we really, are, we're missing because we were able to see all kinds of beautiful people on the Ed Sullivan Show and all those variety shows. So yes, television played a huge uh, um, thing for, for all of, of the artists because we were on, we, the Supremes, were on Ed Sullivan, I think they told me 16 times. I mean, that was major, okay? And, and, and so you had not seen that many Black people in those kind of roles uh, up to that point. Diane Carroll was one of the first uh, Black females that had her own show uh, at that time. Now, there was some prior to that, but at that time, so television played a big a key role in uh, promoting all kinds of things, uh, actors, actresses, singers, uh, products, you know, it just, I mean, it just changes. So it, it was the technology of the day, just like I'm saying, inter the internet and uh, these type things are the new uh, sort of uh, marketing. I mean, people just are marketing. Every if you're on television, honey, you are huge. So I'm trying to get on TV. <laughs> no, just <laughs> I I want to talk about a beginning of some sort. Um, when you first went to Motown, Motown turned you down, didn't they? And I love this story. Can you can you tell us that story with mm -hmm. Motown President Barry Gordy Jr. and how did that happen? Yes. Well, when we I mentioned earlier, we started singing in 1959, uh, and and at the time uh, we had not not thought about a recording. We were just, uh, we were 59, I think we were like 13, 14 years old. And we were just doing this as a hobby. So we started singing as a hobby. And when we started singing, we were put together by three guys who were called the Primes, P-R-I-M-E-S. And they named us the Primes. At the time we were four girls. And, uh, and so we would just, like I said, we would just go around singing at different uh, type of, uh, we call them record hops. That's the, their dances, but back then they were called record hops. And the DJs of the day would have these record hops at various uh, sort of community centers and gymnasiums and wherever. So we did that for a couple of years. And obviously we were still in, in school. Uh, and when we and during high school, we sang all over Detroit, Michigan at these different dances. And so doing, we ran into a lot of uh, stars who were actually recording and they were, they were the stars and the DJs would say, and now we're going to have uh, our own, very own primates. And that was us, right? And so we were, we were the local acts along with the people who were actually recording. recording. And then I, that's when we started seeing, well, wait, wait a minute, well, they're recording, maybe we can start recording. So that's when we sort of, sort of dared to dream, you know, and, and went to Motown. And, uh, we, I, oh, first of all, before we went to Motown, we won this contest in Windsor, Canada, because Detroit, Michigan and Windsor, Canada were across the river from each other. I never even knew that Canada was another country, okay? <laughs> because we, we could go across a bridge and go to Canada just like we were going across the street to go to another, you know, area. Uh, but we, want, we won that contest they had there because they had a contest from all the different acts around Michigan, Canada, and Ohio and the surrounding areas. And we the primates won. That's when we finally decided, okay, maybe we should, you know, go to a record company. And uh, we did, 
go to Motown, audition for Mr. Gordy. And uh, he was very nice. And we sang all our little songs and all those kind of things. But when we finished, he said, well, you know, why don't you girls come back and see me after you graduate from high school? And by this time we were like 15 and 16 years old. So we were about to graduate, but we couldn't figure out why he didn't want, we were good. And I remember Florence Ballard saying, hmm, can't be that great if they don't know how good we are. <laughs> we really thought we were good. And we, I think we were good too. But um, after that, even though he turned us down, he, Mr. Gordy turned us down, we um, eventually went back to the company and every day we would sit outside and we would just kind of wait to be discovered. And one day someone needed hand claps. I think it was one of the producers needed some hand clappers on, on some of the re recordings they were doing that day. And we said, we'll do it, we'll do it. And that's how we got in to Motown. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's a <laughs> phenomenal story. Um, you know, at this time, let's take a look at some of the gorgeous images in this book. Oh, good, good. Um, I can't wait to see them myself. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have them up in just a few seconds. Okay, cool. And there, there's so many of them too. I mean, when I while you're bonding them, I'll tell you that uh, I had the photographer get really up close photos of the the gown, so you can actually see the actual bead work that went into them. Yeah. So this is the cover of the book, um, Supreme Glamour. I want to remind the audience that um, the link to purchase the book is in the chat box today only. If you purchase the book, it will be signed by uh, Miss Mary Wilson. Um, so this first image, this is the cover. I, I wanted to ask, how did you, how did you come to think about, um, how did you select this image to be the cover for your book? Well, actually, I gotta admit, this was not my idea of the cover. My uh, publishers, uh, Tim's and Hudson's over in, in the UK, because I was signed, actually, I should say, uh, by the uh, publisher there, uh, editor there in the UK, in London. And uh, so he decided uh, that he wanted to use this particular uh, shot of us because he wanted to show the, uh, the sequin gowns uh, that we were wearing. I personally didn't care for it because I didn't really like the, that you couldn't see Diane's face. I didn't like that Di Florence and I were bent over. And, and, I, and I tell you why, let me tell you why. <laughs> our mentor, Mrs. Maxine Powell, who well, people say our etiquette teacher, but she wasn't an etiquette. She says, I'm not an etiquette teacher. You need to learn how to pick up your spoons and forks when you're at home by your parents, not me. But she would. She taught us about our inner beauty and, and she taught us how to, yes, walk and sit with our knees closed and our ankles crossed and things, really ladylike type things. And uh, she she passed away and I, and, um, I think she was 90. Uh, by the time she passed away, but she was the uh, person who at Motown Records was in charge of all of the acts and grooming them. Uh, and so I didn't really care for the photos because she would have been very upset had she seen us bending over like that, right? <laughs> but, uh, but I, you know, I had to agree with the publisher. Uh, because you know he was he was he agreed to put my book out and I didn't even have to shop to to have my book uh, published because he just he just went crazy about the idea and he says Mira, I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it I'll, I'll I'll publish it so you know I said well I give him that thing of choosing the photo for the cover even though it wasn't it would not have been my first pick let's put it that way mm -hmm. <laughs> but it still is glamorous I mean you know what it still is glamorous and I I like it I just I just would have preferred had we been uh, more like Mrs. Powell would have, would have wanted us to stand up tall. Right. I remember, I remember one time she told, she said, you know, girls do not put their buttocks, they don't stick their buttocks out. <laughs> and we, we were like the 16 with our buttocks, whoever says buttocks, you know, <laughs> but she was just a great lady. Yeah, well, Maxine Powell seemed like she taught um, you and everyone a lot uh, in those days as well. Um, so this image is beautiful. Um, this is taken in Detroit in 1959. Mm -hmm. um, and this is of you when you were uh, as part of the primates. Can you tell us a little bit about this photograph? 
Yes, this is a, one of the only, you know, this is back in the day in 1959. We, we, everyone didn't have, we didn't have our little cell phones, you know, and our own little, uh, we, you couldn't take your picture. So this is from an Instamatic phone, one of those uh, camera type phone cameras. And it's probably the only picture of us in 1959, maybe one more when we were four. In fact, uh, the original girl over in the corner there, Betty McGlon, you can't even see her, but you can see her smile. <laughs> and uh, then I, then that's me. And you see my little pearls. I got my little pearls. That was 1959. That's Florence and Diane. And, and yeah, it, this, to me, this is a great, great photo. Now, Betty, who was the fourth member, left us shortly after this because she was a little older than, than the three of us and she got married. So we were left with uh, with just the three, but this is when we were four. And I just wish who had, whoever took the photo had left our heads up the arm. <laughs> But at least we got it, you know, we got it. And I think there's one other that shows, uh, it should be in this book too, that shows Betty, where Betty is there. And we had our little sweaters and pleated skirts on and we were doing our little routine. So there were only two of those photos of the four of us. And this this is one of them. Mm, that's very, it's very special photograph then. Yeah. This one is uh, taken in December, 1964. Um, and it's it's beautiful. It's in the it's from the Ed Sullivan show. And um, what's really interesting, I think, for everyone to see is that it's in black and white. But really, the dresses are in a pale blue color, right? Well, I don't know what color they are because we had quite a few of these little same dresses, and it's amazing because uh, the photo that Rupi spoke of that she saw us on TV. She said the dresses were salmon, but because we had black and white TV, she says, who knew that salmon could look so pretty, you know, but <laughs> it was hard to see what color because TV back in those days was, you know, the shows were all in black and white. Mm -hmm. But we did have, I think we actually had uh, this particular gown in a green and we had a blue, as you mentioned, and then the salmon. And I think we also had a pink. So we, we must have bought quite a few of those same uh, ones in different colors. And we wore them on, on a lot of different shows. And this was uh, in 1964, so it was still very early on. What was it like to perform um, on the Ed Sullivan show at that, for the first time? Well, see, 1964 was when our first hit record, mm -hmm. Where Did Our Love Go, was released. So, uh, you know, that we, we, we did Ed Sullivan's show, and that really kicked off our... Um, you know, our career being on his, on his show. Well, I'm sorry, what was your, your last part of your question? I, I kind of, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, I, we want, I, I just was wondering um, what it felt like to be on such a big show. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yes. So it, it, um, 1964 was a huge year for us because we had our first hit record. It was not the first record that we released, but it was like, I think number eight, something like that. So for us then to uh, have it as a, a number one record and to be on the number one TV show, uh, the Ed Sullivan show, that meant, that meant uh, people said, well, when did you become you know, most famous? That was when we became very famous being on the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it, it just kept, it, we were on there so many times that it really, it really, I think helped, it helped make us be, uh, become so famous because we were on there so many times, but it felt like we had made it. I mean, that's, that was the phrase we always said, we made it when we went on the Ed Sullivan show. Um, and it just, it felt like our dreams had come true. I yeah. might, one, of, one of the phrases that I always say is dreams do come true. And that's when our dreams came true. Mm -hmm. In this next image, um, let's wait for, so this is also in 1965, and um, this, these are images, both of these are images from, um, from when you were filming, It's What's Happening Baby. Can you tell us a little bit about these two photographs? Well, well that was uh, Murray DeCage uh, television show, uh, mm -hmm. New Jersey, New York area. And uh, so uh, he was one of the very popular DJs 
that uh, had a lot of different acts on on the different on his shows, and um, so this was one. Uh, uh, it was great because we rarely wore our uh, how can I say it, our personal clothes on TV shows because we were always in gowns or dresses or you know really dressed up. But because this was such a casual kind of outing, uh, we decided to, okay, we're going to wear not our gowns out there on the grass or our heels. We're going to put on some really casual, keep our casual clothes on. And that's what this was all about. I love, this is one of the few pictures you see of Florence Ballard up close. And it's one of my favorites of her because uh, she, she was smiling and she was looking so happy. But there we are dancing over there. And this suit that I had on here was a suit that I actually wore when we were in Paris. We were in Paris, France. And I recall that uh, we were running down the champs Elysees, and the police stopped us because we were singing on the street. That would be like riding down the fifth, fifth uh, Avenue in New York City, singing, stopping all the traffic. Uh, without a permit, we learned later that the producer of a TV show that we were filming didn't have a, a permit and that we could have been arrested. But I, I always liked it because it's the same suit that I wore uh, on, on this particular uh, TV show that you see here, you're showing here, this picture. Yeah, well, it's, it's just the style is, is impeccable. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> We'll see the next image. So this is also 1965. You mentioned, um, you know, your tour in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, gorgeous photo of Florence, Diana, and you, Miss Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask a little bit. Um, you know, 1960. You, you mentioned in your book that 1965 was when you started wearing wearing wigs, right? Uh, 65, well, yeah, it was pretty much that time, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask, um, what made you decide to start wearing hair pieces? Okay, so I tell you what, we were, we, our, all of us had really great hair. I mean, in fact, I remember one of the shows that we did, the, the Tammy uh, TV show, uh, I, I was wearing my own hair there, and it's one of the few times that you can see my, myself wearing the uh, my own hair, but and uh, after traveling and touring, because we had done several tours now, it was very difficult to be on a bus uh, every day and try to do your hair uh, and, and get on stage that evening and for your hair to, you know, look great. So that's the reason why we started wearing hair pieces was because it was very difficult to keep your hair uh, up, uh, you know, you can go to a beauty shop, beauty parlor in, in every city. <laughs> so we, if we found it was easier to wear hair pieces so that we wouldn't, you know, have to always constantly do our hair on the road. Um, and that was, that's, that's, that was the main reason. Well, that is so smart. And, um, obviously they're, they're so gorgeous. I, I wanted to, um, ask in this, in this next photo, um, these are geisha outfits on tour of the Far East. Uh, Mr. Barry Gordy Jr. documented the trip. And so this was taken in 1966. Could you tell us a little bit about what it, what it was like to be fitted for a geisha outfit? It was a huge to do to be fitted for these outfits. And as you can see, we were, had the hair pieces. That was, those were definitely hair pieces. They're very heavy too. Mm -hmm. uh, and and someone I, I see on one of the chats, they asked who was our hairdresser, Gregory, his name was Gregory. God, I can't think of Gregory's last name right now, but he actually did all of our hair pieces. But this particular, uh, these particular hair pieces were done by geishas there in Japan while we were on tour. And that took all day pretty much to prepare uh, to get, you know, us dressed in these geisha outfits. And we had the shoes and we had, it was just great. I think these were the wedding um, geisha kimonos that we had on. And I mean, you know, the, because one person would tie the bows, the big bows we had in the back. One person would do all the head pieces. One person would tie, you know, it was just a, a lot to put together. So I remember the, the photographer at Barry Gore said, can you guys hurry up because the sun's gonna be going down pretty soon. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was a, a much to do. And I actually uh, recall 
now that I'm seeing this picture, that later on in the 70s, when uh, after both Florence and Diane were no longer in the group, and I had uh, hired uh, other uh, singers, great singers, uh, Sherry Payne, I think was there, and uh, Suze Green, we were, we um, sort of copied the same photograph in the 70s. And this was done in 1965, as you mentioned. Mm. <laughs> so this photograph um, is taken in November 1967, or the still. Um, and it's you, uh, the group, and the temptations. So can you tell us a little bit about um, what we're seeing here? Yes. Well, right now, uh, you know, this is the temptations, two of the members of the temptations, Eddie and uh, Paul Williams, Eddie Kendricks and Paul Williams were the two guys who actually formed us and they were in they they were in the group of the primes. Well, they went on to join uh, Ed, uh, Otis Williams in um, becoming uh, members of the Temptations. So we, they're like kind of our brother group, group in a way, you know, they were our brothers. And throughout the years, we worked with the Temptations because of that relationship, you know, having known them since the very beginning and, and Eddie and Paul putting us together. So uh, we actually ended up doing uh, two specials with the Temptations. And that was uh, uh, GIT on Broadway and TCB. Uh, that were our two, this was like the first for any pop group to have a television special. So we were, that was 1968. So we were really, you know, popular at the time. And, uh, you know, when we did, the, I think the Ed Sullivan show a couple of times, he all, he had the, uh, the two groups on. I remember this outfit we wore, the, these were minis when minis came in. Uh, you know, and we were, we were definitely uh, wearing minis back in those days, very short minis. Not as short as some of the girls are wearing them now, I see. But anyway, <laughs> it, we, I thought it was it was great. And now also, uh, you can't tell from here, but I that's when I was wearing my blonde hair pieces. So I was wearing blonde hair back in 1968. Uh, so this was really this was really a great uh, great time working with the Temptations, our brothers. Amazing. So this one here, this was taken in 1967. Uh, of the gowns, um, pink bow. Um, and this is a beautiful portrait of Miss um, Diana, Miss Florence, and you, Miss Wilson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and this actually is, is the set of gowns that were bought, uh, yeah, bought on eBay for me that had been lost. So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, and and uh, because the young man who bought them uh, really helps so much in terms of getting these gowns back. So that was really, I have to say, a special thanks to him. Yeah, so we actually get a little bit of a closer look on these gowns in the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so here we are. Okay, now these gowns, let me tell you, this, if, it's amazing because these were not, these were gowns that we had before we got into the uh, uh, the very the designer gowns because these were gowns we bought. Mm -hmm. uh, they were bought from uh, a boutique. So, but you know, it's amazing how the, uh, many of them have held up because this is, bef you know, this is before uh, Michael Travis or Bob Mackey gowns. And these are, are from, uh, you know, 19, Florence was still in the group. So basically Florence wore all of these type of gowns that we bought and very few of the designer gowns, she was no longer in the group when uh, we started wearing the designer gowns. So uh, this is, these are kind of special for me to see because you can see Florence in these gowns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> so here we are in 1968 uh, with the green swirls gowns. Um, here's Cindy, Diane, and, um, and Mary. Uh, so basically, this is a photo session, right, for the television special TCB. Yes, this is, and I, I do want to bring up this is it's the first time you can actually see Cindy Birdsong and not Florence Ballard in the group, mm -hmm. because at, in '68 uh, Cindy joined us, um, and maybe maybe the latter '67 because Florence was in and out in 1967, but this is like really the official 
time when Cindy Birdsong uh, took Florence's place. And uh, we had photo sessions, yes, for our television special, which was uh, TCB, TCB. And of course, Michael Travis, who I wish I had a picture. I didn't have a very good picture to put in the book of Michael Travis, who actually designed many of our gowns, or earlier um, uh, uh, designer gowns for us. Um, and I, I'm going to do a, a volume two of the Supreme Glamour. And I hope, hope to have a, a really wonderful picture of Michael Travis because he really introduced us to uh, designer gowns. Mm -hmm. We can have a, we we have a closer look of this of these gowns in the next slide. There they are. Okay, now here here's my thing about that I want everyone to notice that the, looking at the gowns from like this, it looks like this is probably just a picture uh, of 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 the gowns. And but it really is each designer here, each uh, sequin and, uh, and bugle beads are, were put on a piece of material that had the, the, these design on it. So every one, so those designs are not just a painting of, of, of designs; they are actually uh, beads. Mm -hmm. That's all beads. So I I was very fortunate to um, to talk with a lot of the women who actually worked on these gowns. And they spent hours putting all of these beads on there. I mean, there are billions and trillions of beads and sequins and, and, and bugle beads on this gown, on that pattern. So wow. if you would just think about it being a pattern with this um, type of design on it, and then they had to, the women had to actually sew on all of the beads onto that pattern to make this dress. So it's quite a bit uh, of work that went into each one of the gowns. Wow, wow, it's so gorgeous. Um, here's another Michael Travis um, creation. Yes. This is the butterfly gowns, and this is in 1968. Can you tell us a little bit about this image? Well, yeah, but I, I wish I, I could see the other image. Is, is there another one there like this? Yes. So you can actually see the... Uh, yep the gowns now this is better only because i want you to see that the gowns themselves were completely beaded the bodice of the gown was completely beaded and again the beads were made uh sewn onto this design of web like a web type design so each one of those sequins and beads and uh were sewn onto there now if you open up the arms and you see in the towards the back there that's actually uh like a cape and it, 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 it if you open it up i think they were on the cover of our um the album too as as well and and it's um we call them what do we call those gowns uh you have the picture that the what the butterfly gowns butterfly yes because once the, all the arms open up it looks like butterfly and it's absolutely just exquisite. I mean, it's probably one of the more exquisite gowns that we have. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Travis had such a wonderful, wonderful eye for design. And unfortunately, he had MS and passed away very early in life. I mean, he was not that old when he passed away. And I was very fortunate to interview him uh, before he passed. And I was so happy about that because uh, He's just a, a not only a tremendous designer, but he's quite handsome too. And he's also he was also from Detroit. I'm looking for his caretaker, who uh, who took care of him until till he passed away, uh, a couple of so uh, I forgot which year, but just about four years ago. So yeah, these are one of my favorites, the butterfly gowns. Well, we can see another one of his creations in the next in the next slide. Okay. There is more butterfly gowns there. Yes, I yes. Yeah. And, and now, if you look at this, when I mentioned this, because I was wearing the blonde hairpiece then too, I was really into blonde. I thought I was Doris Day. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. So anyway, but if you look at that platform, this was our stage. This was huge. I mean, it was. I think we were about I don't know, maybe twelve feet up in the air. George Slaughter. And uh, his production team were the ones that produce our TV, our television special. But this was a great stage to perform on. It was all glass. And if you, I, I try not to look down. It was almost like you can't look up at the sun because you know you just can't because it hurt your eyes. When the stage, you couldn't look down because 
you know, it was like scary to look down and see the floor that far away from you. Wow, that's... <laughs> now, someone just said plexiglass. I think it was your yes, plexiglass. Oh, now here, now this this set of gowns, I I said Michael Travers was the first to introduce us to designer gowns. However, I was a little incorrect because this set of gowns, which is uh, two pieces, uh, three pieces actually, it was a gown plus a coat trench coat and uh, uh, belts. Uh, this is by Levita. And she was, uh, she was our first designer who, who we met in uh, San Francisco. We were working at, uh, 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 in San Francisco for about two or three weeks at the Fairmont Hotel. And uh, she, she being, uh, um, Levita came and she said, you know, I, I design uh, gowns for a first lady and I'd love to design some gowns for you. And she was also designing for Nancy Wilson at the time. And so she brought us some, um, um, you, you know, designs and this was one. And this is quite a lot of work here. I mean, these gowns, you can't quite tell from here but they're all pleated. And on each of the edge of the pleats are, are um, bugle beads all the way around. And the top of course has the, the beads at the top. The, coat the trench coats were um all um i think the, was it satin yeah i guess satin you call it and it had the beadwork all on it so she was she really alita levita was our first um designer and she was a woman which was really quite cool amazing mm -hmm. uh-huh now we're coming up to bob mackey's gowns i think yes these were bob mackey's yeah um, so so what happened was, um, for some reason, in our second uh, television special, um, Bob, uh, Michael Travis was not the designer, and they brought in uh, Bob Mackey, who followed uh, Michael Travis in terms of, of designing for the Supremes. And, and so he did this set of gowns along with our black velvet gowns, black butterfly gowns. These are really quite exquisite as well. They're very sexy, made on an A, uh, what you call it, A-line? Oh gosh, now I'm having a, a mental block here. Uh, and at the bottom were feathers, uh, the pink feathers. Uh, very sexy gowns. I always enjoyed wearing them. And I was able to wear these gowns with uh, some of the ladies in the 70s, Jean Terrell, I think, and uh, Linda Lawrence also wore those along with me. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so now a bias, that's what the word, I couldn't think of what the word was. It was, they were cut on the bias. And so that's really gives you a, a woman a very sexy kind of shape when things are on the bias, you know, they really lay well on your body. Uh, thank you for, you know, I see all the little notes down there that everyone is sending me the uh, answer to, which is good because a lot of times, you know, I write things because you have all the people who help you, but then when you're on your own trying to remember everything, it's kind of hard to remember everything correctly. So thank you to all of your uh, panelists who are sitting in their little ideas. This is another sexy guy. And so now, Angela, now who, can you read? Who yeah, this is this is the designer, Michael Nicole, Nicola. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is in 1971. Um, yep, Golden Sunshine is the name of these gowns. Okay, so now Michael Nicola was another designer that we used, and I've tried to get in touch with Michael Nicola. He did quite a few for us as well, uh, and 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 I've been told that he actually left designing, and he's in another kind of business. He doesn't even design any longer. But these were wool gowns. And initially they had wood, uh, woolen sleeves all the way down to, to your, your wrist. And we found that the gowns were very sexy and felt good to wear. However, because the wool was wool, uh, we, it was very difficult to wear because we performed and we would sweat. And so it would really spoil the, your underarms of the, of, the, of the sleeve there. So we had to stop, uh, we had to have them cut the sleeves off, oh, but just because of that, but they still were gorgeous because they were all beaded at the wrist and everything was very beautiful, just hard to wear, <laughs> you know, because of the underarms. <laughs> we have another um, set of dresses by Michael and Nicola. Um, this is called White Rain. 
Yes. Now, white uh, white rain, I, and and I got you. I have to let you know that I renamed a lot of gowns, and I've actually named a lot of gowns because when we were wearing some of them earlier on, we didn't have names for them. Uh, and I I've seen some of the fans. They've come up and tried to name some of our gowns, and I've I've had to say that that's not what we call the gowns. I don't know where because they made up their own. You know, they created their own whatever. But these also had arms, and the arms that were on these were absolutely gorgeous. However, they were every. It was. I, I'm trying to see. Do you have another set of these? Because I want to show how the, the beading was individual beads uh, on the arms. And uh, what happened was whenever we would move our arms, which we always did so often, they would get tangled and we'd get tangled up with each other. And so we actually had to remove the sleeve again because the, the, the long sleeve was okay, but the beads that hang, hung from them were the ones that we always got tangled. So when we would come on stage, we wouldn't look very elegant you know, uh, you know, because we all tangled up. So we had to have the removed. And someone asked, do we have any with the sleeves? I do have some with the sleeves, but I guess right now the ones we put up today, uh, we don't have. But in the in the in the book, they are the pictures of the of the ones that with the sleeves, I believe. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, oh my God, these are some of my favorites. And I tell you why, because as on the side here, you see the one with, I was expecting in the seventies. And this is when uh, Sherry Payne was in the group as well as Cindy Birdsong. And uh, I was having my children in the seventies. So my first child to Kessa, who's now 45 years old. So it shows you how old the gowns are. And my son, uh, Pedro, Pedrito, I think he's 43. Uh, I, I don't know which one I was expecting during the time that this I wore the gown, but I had a fourth gown made to match our original gowns so that I could, uh, you know, still perform. And I performed each, I had three children. I performed each time um, uh, until my ninth month uh, during the time. So I had fun wearing my gowns when I was expecting. It was like so much fun. <laughs> Here we are. This is uh, Flo's last photo shoot, right? Uh, I think that's what we said. It was one of the last, for sure, yes, mm -hmm. during the last time. And you can see the sadness in her eyes at the time. I, I, I almost kind of you know, hated to see this picture because it did bring back sad times for, for, for us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, these gowns are one of the gowns and, uh, that we bought on Hollywood Boulevard. And I think the name of the shop, the boutique was called, um, oh God, it keeps going, um, oh, I can't, can't cause, cause my mind. But it was amazing because we used to do a lot of shopping on Hollywood Boulevard back in the late 60s uh, because we were always doing uh, NBC television shows there during that time. And we, uh, on our time off, we'd go shopping. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, these gowns were bought on Hollywood Boulevard. And it was one of my favorite gowns. I thought they were very sexy gowns. Mm -hmm. And they were just totally uh, sequined. Mm -hmm. Here's it. This one is in uh, December 23rd, 1969. Okay. Um, and this was from the Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas. And this is another Michael Travis designed gown. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, can you tell us a little about this photo? I, I know that the, the gown, unfortunately, was part of the fire in Mexico City in 74. So it does, it's not with, with you today, but it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. So now there are um, several, there were three different colors. Each of us had different colors. That's what I liked about uh, Michael Travis. He did that a lot. Uh, and so one set was green, one set was, I think, blue. Uh, each one had a different hue to it, but they were all sequined. And these were some of the lighter gowns. When I say lighter, I mean light weighted gowns. They weren't heavy at all. Some of our gowns were very heavy, but these were because they were um, sequ uh, yeah, sequined and not beaded so much uh, that they were very light to wear. And this set was the, th the three of them, they were all bell bottoms. Uh, so very, very uh, sexy gowns. 
uh, well, not gals, they were pantsuits, you know, but <laughs> bell bottoms because bell bottoms were very popular at that time. I really liked the hairstyle that uh, Diane had right here too. Um, mm -hmm. That it was very, very sexy hairstyle. Mm -hmm. And here's one. Um, now, uh, the, these were born, these were all, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, it just reminded me that these, these were the gowns that were actually destroyed in the fire mm -hmm. that you mentioned. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I cut you off there. Oh, no, no. I was, I was just mentioning that this, these gowns were also um, Michael Travis creations and yes. uh, you, you named them the chandelier gowns. And so they're so gorgeous and you can see the chandelier effect on the gowns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, totally, you know, it's a, a very named appropriately because, uh, yeah, they look like chandeliers. I just loved those gowns. I would have loved to have had someone recreate them. Uh, and, and, you know, that could happen soon. It'd be nice to have dolls with these, wouldn't it, uh, made uh, like this. And again, I have my little blonde hair. I was still a blonde in the 60s, late 60s. Uh, and uh, that Cindy Bird song, because a lot of people still get Cindy and, and Florence mixed up, you know, but if you're talking 68 on, it, it was Cindy in the group and not Florence for those people who are not aware, uh, because a lot of people say Black people all look alike. Well, we don't. <laughs> but I, I do have to say that Cindy and Flo were, had a similar look. They really did. Mm -hmm. And their, 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 body, their bodies, bodies were similarly shaped as well. They were both very buxom kind of women and stacked. Uh, I've had a lot of guys, oh yeah, we love the Florence and, and Cindy because they were really stacked. You and Diane were skinny. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. But yeah, these are my favorite, uh, the chandeliers. They're definitely my, they were very beige. And so on stage with the lighting, they were so sexy because it looked like all you could see were the beads in strategic, uh, place, place in a you know uh, certain places you know the boobs and all, all those areas, and so it looked like you could almost see through them because mm -hmm. with the lights on it, they just the, the, it was sparkled on all of the the bead work that was on there. I love them, love these gowns, chandeliers. Well, I just wanted to remind the audience that the link to purchase the uh, Supreme Glamour book written by Miss Mary Wilson is in the chat box. And today only if you purchase this book, um, they will be signed by Miss Wilson. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think at this time, let's take a couple of questions from the audience. Sure. Um, and I see one really good one uh, that we want to start with, which is you mentioned that 1967, 1968, mm -hmm. a lot of things changed. Miss Cindy Burt's song replaced Miss Ballard. Can you tell us about that year? Um, and the question was, you know, what what in, what inspired this replacement, this change? Well, you know what, that's a long story, <laughs> and it's also a, something that has to do with. Uh, I think if people read my book, my first book, uh, Dream Girl, uh, the full story will be there. And to try to tell you in a, in a couple of sentences wouldn't do it. Uh, justice, but Miss Florence Ballard uh, had uh, a, a very difficult time uh, in her life because early on, and I'll just say this right out bluntly, uh, she was abused when she was 14, and we were we were just you know we were still we were singing had started singing, and this uh, was something that really hurt her tremendously and kind of stopped her from being the happy-go-lucky girl that she was. And so it kind of led, led to later on in life, lots of problems for her. And she was just unable to kind of cope with what was going on with the rise of the group and things of that nature. So she had to be replaced. And it was very sad, but I, I would recommend you read my book, uh, Dream Girl, just to get the real story. Because she was a wonderful lady, but Sometimes life throws things at you. And if you're young and you don't get help uh, uh, for certain problems, they can just lead you to being very, very unhappy. And that's kind of half of what happened to Flo. To make well, it Go ahead. You know, I, I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing that. It's uh, very personal and it's also very um, inspiring for you to write about it. Yes. I wanted to ask another question from the audience, which is, um, 
how heavy were that you mentioned that the, some of the beaded gowns were very heavy so how heavy were they to wear and to perform in well the uh, you know the ones that were heavily beaded in beadwork uh, uh, because the ones that are um we call them the, the queen mother gowns which were they weighed about 30 some pounds each because they had the sequins are very light unless we just we we talked about the ones that we saw that were just sequins um they're they're very lightweight but the beads are the ones that make gowns very heavy and our our, our queen mother gowns had beads pearls sequins i mean rhinestones it had everything on each one of the gowns so those are heavy and um, even the butterflies that were heavily beaded, but they were heavily beaded with sequins. So they were not as heavy. And in order to wear those gowns, I don't think for myself, I never felt uh, uncomfortable because it was, we were always, you know, we were playing dress up. So for us, you know, to get all dressed up in these beautiful gowns, I mean, I don't care if they were heavy, I, we would never let you know it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They really, I, I don't think, I don't think they were too heavy for us to wear because first of all, they were so well constructed. And I mentioned to you about the people who had constructed these gowns and the designers, Michael Travis, Bob Mackey, uh, you know, who went, went on to do Diana, Diane's uh, gowns and Cher's gowns and many others. You know, they constructed these gowns so well that when you put them on, they were on your body and they embraced you and they didn't feel cumbersome, you know? So um, it, it, I, don't, I, I don't think I ever, except the ones I mentioned with the arms, with the tangles, where the beads get tangled up, those type of things, but in order, uh, uh, in order but the others are, were not hard to wear at all. And we mm -hmm. moved well in them and it was all really quite good. <laughs> We have an amazing question, which is, what was the input that you had on the gowns that you that were being designed for you? Um, in either the gowns, the jewelry, the, the accessories, um, what input did you have in part of that creative process? Um, well, we were very lucky. Uh, before we had designer gowns, uh, we had chaperones who always helped us. You know what I mean? They helped us pick our gowns. Uh, I remember the, the Copacabana gown gowns that we wore there and they're on an album cover uh were were we were helped by maximus powell and uh barry gordy's sister um gwen gordy so we always had a lot of uh female adults to help us in terms of choosing certain things the right things to wear and whatever but we three uh, really had a lot to say about what we liked and what we wanted to wear. Um, it it did, did come a time uh, after, say, the Motown machinery took over and we, three of us, didn't make our own decisions any longer. That Sometimes that became a problem because we would have to wear certain things that maybe were not made for our body types, like Florence was a bit heavier. She wasn't fat, I mean, but in the right places, she was heavier, you know, and, and, but yet and still she was covered up from head to toe and just for, was maybe not as flattering for her. So, you know, sometimes we'd have to sort of give in and just and just wear whatever was best for the total group and total look. And, and that was okay too, because we we still like looking pretty, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it wasn't a big a big thing. So, but we, we, we could say if we definitely didn't like something, we could say that. You know, we, we, no one made us do anything. So it was like, what was best for the group was usually our motto for whatever we did and more. Ms. Wilson, you've lived a very, very big life. Um, you've done so many things. Uh, so recently you were on Dancing with the Stars. What was that like? Oh, Dance with the Stars was just absolutely fun, 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 fun. And it's also, you like I mentioned earlier about TV, uh, because for the past, 25, 30 years, I probably have not been on television a lot. I've been mostly traveling around the world because I was uh, appointed uh, an ambassador by Colin Powell uh, during the reign of uh, President uh, Bush. And, uh, you know, so I really wasn't on TV a lot and the exposure I was getting was around the world, but, you know, just in, in certain places, not like uh, being on television. 
So being there was fun because it exposed me to a lot of people that, you know, they said, well, the Supremes, that was back in the 60s. I mean, aren't, aren't they, haven't they retired? Of course, Diana hasn't retired, but I mean, but, you know, the rest of us people thought we were probably at home, you know, sitting watching TV or something. But uh, so being on Dancing with the Stars was great because it gave me that new sort of exposure to people. And uh, in terms of what we did on the show was great. My coach, Brandon, was absolutely exquisite. He was just a wonderful guy. He reminded me of one of my grandsons, Mark Anthony. And I always told Brandon that he reminded me of my grandson. And, and he was a great coach. And uh, I think what he, he recognized that I wasn't, uh, that I was 76 years old. And I wasn't like a young, you know, young girl doing all those, those type dances. Uh, so it was fun. Um, I love being on TV. In fact, I'd like to have my own TV show. You know, maybe I can be a, a great hostess myself on TV. Uh, it was fun. It was fun. And the show was definitely glamorous. I mean, they really tried to do everything first class. So I had a ball. I really did awesome. enjoy it. Mm -hmm. If you had your own TV show, we would all be glued to it. Um, I wanted to, we were all, we all want to know um, what other projects you've done. So I know that there is a new album that came out and there's also a documentary out. Can you tell us about that? Uh, can you give me that question again? Something happened there that I lost you. Sure. So um, we wanted to know what other things you've worked on. So we know oh. that there's a new album that came out and there's also a documentary and we wanted to know a little bit more about that. Okay. Now for myself, um, I, I've actually, as you mentioned, I have four books. So I'm, you know, my new, newest project, which happened the same time as Dancing with the Stars, was The Supreme Glamour, the book that we've been speaking about all evening. So that's basically my latest project. But my other is Florence, oh, that's the wrong one. It's Florence Ballard. Oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> And uh, I'm working on getting a U.S. stamp for Miss uh, Florence Ballard. However, I've just heard from the Postal uh, Service that, you know, because of things that, that are going on, they may just dis well, discontinue having Black heritage stamps out there. So I hope that that's not true, because I really would like to have this stamp for Florence Ballard. Um, and so that's, that's my latest project that I'm working on. I'm currently working on a releasing a, a, a new CD and speaking with Universal Music who handles the Motown catalog in terms of uh, my uh, releasing a new CD. Uh, but you know, that's something who knows. Now, the latest thing that I've been involved with is the Music Modernization Act. Uh, which has legislation, which has to do with a lot of, of uh, um, post, well, let's put it this way. If, um, if people download music, um, people from who have recorded post uh, 1972, they're being paid. People who recorded before uh, or pre 1972, we're not being paid whenever that music is down, uh, digitally downloaded. So uh, that's something that that music legislation has just been passed and it was passed and it was signed by the president. Uh, uh, and so I'm very happy that that's happening. Uh, also, just recently, the Truth in Music Bill that has to do with people, fake people using fake, uh, using the names of uh, music uh, artists like the Drifters, the Supremes, whatever, and saying that it's them. Uh, that is something that's still being worked on and working to try to get that passed in the federal courts. But Hawaii has just passed the bill. So it's been passed in about 30 some states so far. So those are kind of the current things we're working on. And the most latest thing, hey, Mary Wilson's YouTube channel now, folks. And I just reached, thanks to my team, a thousand subscribers. And that happened in just a month. Oh my God, I can't believe it. So it happened just, a, uh, just this past month and I will be uh, putting out, uh, you know, things from my, the vaults and the Motown vaults and all those kind of things and talking about myself, Florence Ballard, Dinah Ross, and uh, just, you know, talk, just, I have in, in that YouTube channel, The Happenings, which I, I do a little speaking and telling people what's been going on in my life.
So that's those are the two things. And my grandchildren, mm, love them all. <laughs> well, I just wanted to let the people know um, that remember to subscribe to Miss Mary Wilson's YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. Also, thank you so much for joining us today, Miss Mary Wilson. It's been a huge honor to have you with us. Oh, I just want to remind the audience if you're interested in Miss Wilson's book, Supreme Glamour, the link to order is in the chat box. Um, and today, uh, all, the per all the purchases of the books will be signed by Mary. Um, so if you're interested in any of the other programs pre presented by the National Arts Club, you can visit our YouTube channel. You could also go to nationalartsclub.org. I am Angela Louie, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. <laughs>